Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, but I haven't interviewed him in many, many years, unfortunately, but I'm excited to speak to him now. He's now in the United States. He's moved away from mainland China, but his knowledge and experience of things going on in the Chinese economy is incredibly invaluable. He worked there for around 20 years. I think he helped open the first General Motors plant in mainland China. He's currently the founder of Hippograph Data Security and Tyrell Medical. Dan Collins, thank you for coming back on. Thanks, Jason. Great to be back. So, Dan, we're recording this interview on Friday, September 29th, 2023. Before we talk about the Chinese economy, the stuff going on with their housing bubble or credit, their commodities purchases, their gold demand, stuff like that that uh, our listeners are very interested in. I get questions asked about this all the time, about the Chinese economy and their commodities demand, stuff like that. So we'll get into that later in the interview. First, maybe talk about your background though, Uh, going to China, living in China. How long did you live there? Who did you work for? Uh, Your networking. I know you had a lot of great contacts there too. Yeah, so I moved. I uh, left United States 1998 as an exchange student, uh, went over to Beijing as an exchange student at Tsinghua University, which is kind of the, they call it the MIT of China. It's actually ranked above on the global, above MIT now in the global rankings. It's really where all the brain power and epicenter of all Chinese tech and politicians go. Basically it's right there in Beijing at Tsinghua University and and Beijing University, which is down the street. So I did that as an exchange student, uh, was there in uh, school for a year after I graduated. Um, I'm an engineer by background, worked in General Motors, um, you know, helped starting up their business there, Um, was there more than a decade, just going all through just the late 90s now, early 2000s, completely different world. I, I lived through the fastest industrialization the world's ever seen what happened in China. So I kind of have a living memory of it all. I still, you know, have a house there. Um, and, uh, haven't been back in two years now, but, uh, yeah, I lived over there 20 years, engineering background. I ran, uh, fortune 500 companies, their China divisions. I ran Taiwanese companies. I'm fluent in Chinese. I, um, um, and as you know, I've been a guest on a lot of, uh, shows over the last decade, really talking about China and the Chinese economy. So what do you think are some of the common misconceptions or misunderstandings by Westerners about the Chinese economy and the way things are run there? There's a lot of misinformation and just a lot of uh, misunderstanding. The the economies are too different. They're in many ways mere opposites of each other. Over here in the United States, it's money printing, it's it's paper profits, it's uh, buy now, pay later type of stuff. China, it's production, production manufacturing you know there are different types of you know economies and different cultures different concepts um you know over we before we talk about what's going on now in china i can tell you over the last you know i saw the rise you're talking about an economy that went in the last 20 years has built 100 million apartments 400 international airports unlimited factories you can start at pudong international airport in shanghai drive five hours at 60 miles an hour, you will see nothing but block to block factories. Once you get out the side of the city, it's just factories, factory factories. That's all over the country. China makes 50% of everything in the world now, chemicals. I mean, you basically name anything, they make 50% of it um, or more, and especially in the metal space, right? They're talking about metals refining. They're in many cases, 60 to 90% of it, right? Especially with rare earths and these types of things. But they are a, the most dominant dynamic, powerful economy going today. I mean, when you compare China to the United States, it's not even a competition. We can no lo- we can't make an LNG carrier here. We made one ocean going container ship uh last year. China made a thousand. Okay. We made 10 million vehicles here in the United States. China makes 30 million. Okay. They're now leading the world in the EVs. They are taking over the export market of Japan and the United States. So they're dominating. They make 50% of the world's EVs. United States, we made 10 million cars in 1970. We made 10 million cars last year. I don't think people realize that. The absolute decline of our industrial base that has happened over the decades. So the misunderstanding here is I don't think Americans understand what real GDP is. It's all fake here. It's it's uh, it's huge insurance bills and huge medical bills and 
huge lawyer bills and and lease this, lease that. Company A leases the company B. They both make a profit. It's a lot of fugazi in this economy. And that's where most of your people talking about China have never been there. They don't speak Chinese. So there's a lot of just completely misunderstanding. You can get a you can get the cut, you can get kind of a rough idea, but then you don't have any of the background of really what's going on. And if you want to like dive deeper in the property sector, I can tell you all about those kind of some of the behind the curtain type things that are going on. But that's the main, there's just, there's a big, you know, and the political relationship now between China and U.S. has just gotten worse and worse. You know, we've been making up stories about them, attacking them. And the recently the relationships have gone off the rails. So some of the people that know China better, we're trying to, trying to work and get the real message out there that, you know, we need to coexist with China and we're going to have to rebuild our own economy, focus on that first. and. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I say. The main the main thing is there's a big knowledge gap on China for people in the West. Yeah. So I want to talk about GDP, actually. So uh, a lot of the U.S.'s GDP now is based not only on consumer spending, depending upon how you measure it. And like you said, the consumer is not spending from savings. They're spending money they don't have. They're paying for things on credit, buy now, pay later. But then if you buy a car on credit, subprime auto loans, you're paying almost double the amount later on for that. And whereas China um, in 2008, 2009, I would argue that they helped the global economy get out of potentially the great financial crisis because they spent what, around 50% of their GDP went into infrastructure investments. And that just really spurred a commodities boom. And would you also argue that that also um, there was misallocation of capital there as well with the amount of um, infrastructure plan and housing plan too? Um, from 2009. Yeah, absolutely. Onwards. I remember, I remember, yeah, I remember the time well. I was running a Taiwanese conglomerate in mainland China at that time. We had about six plants, mainly doing steel. And the government would come in weekly, the CCP guys, which they never were there. They never bothered you. But at that time, they were coming around because the economy was so dire, as anyone remembers back in 08, 09, all of the exports stopped, which you've seen this year happening. We can talk more about that this year, or, you know, coming up. But uh, yeah, I was there. They come in. What do we need to do? Well, how can we help you? Do you need loans? What's going on? How's your order book look like? So yeah, I remember it well. Um, that led to a massive spending. It was, you know, compared to what America came in with the TARP bailouts and all that, they probably spent double relative to their GDP to re restart, re-kick the global economy. So yeah, they had a major hand but, in bailing so, everything but- out. But that was on stuff, though. So China wanted copper, steel, aluminum. This was on building things. So they were building buildings, building infrastructure and airports. They were building actual stuff, whereas a lot of the money that the U.S. spent on bailouts, it was buying mortgage-backed securities. It was subsidizing too big to fail banks or General Motors and large corporations that I would argue really didn't deserve a bailout, but they got one anyway. So like the U.S. has crumbling infrastructure. I've seen you post this stuff on your Twitter, too. So China has focused on infrastructure for decades, whereas the U.S. has not. Yeah, we we passed a trillion dollar Build Back Better program. Has anything got built here? This is a this is a red flag. I mean, in this country where you can't get anything done, like, like forget the. I always tell people like forget the GDP numbers. It's all fake. Even in China, I never paid attention to that. Sometimes the GDP was up. They'd say twelve percent, but it was actually like twenty percent. And sometimes like this year is for sure negative, but they're going to say 5%. I don't pay attention to it, but pay attention to how an economy can produce and the technological level and organization, what they can get done. So, how, you know, can they, can they build apartments? Can they build factories? Can they build products? This is where U.S. is failing horribly now. We can't get anything done. Despite how much money we print and spend and throw out into the economy, nothing we have seemed to uh, lost the ability to make things and get things done. Big well, also, flag. also a lot of U.S. manufacturing it either breaks or it's a lie. It's marketing, so something will be uh, it'll be stamped like assembled in the U.S. and people are like, oh, it's made in the U.S. It's actually not made in the U.S. The parts are all coming that were already made in either China or Japan with a just-in-time inventory or another country or Mexico through yep. NAFTA, and then it's assembled. Those finished parts are just assembled then by some workers in the United States. Absolutely. That's a good point. Not a lot of people realize that, that U.S. manufacturing became warehouses and assembly operations. And we called that productivity, right? So Caterpillar would have a big plant and in-house they'd make this 
pump and they'd make, you know, this house and he'd make this, They'd close it all down, have a Chinese manufacturer send it to us. You can get rid of your labor here, but you're still selling the Caterpillar machine at the same price. Your productivity skyrockets because you're not using the same amount of labor or inputs, but you're still getting the same revenue. And, but you hollow out your industrial base. That's gone on for decades now. And now we are at the point where we literally can't make anything. Every, we are completely dependent on uh, China mainly for imports. And uh, if you look at what's happening now in EVs, they're just running circles around us. We Our last technical redoubt in the United States is semiconductors. And we're really going head to head on a tech war now with China, which we're, which we're losing. So um, yeah, we have, I've, I've I spouted this for 20 years now. We've got to get back to, you know, to blocking and tackling of producing goods for an economy. We're starting to look like the Soviet Union where we can't produce anything or get anything done. Well, the main problem, Dan, actually starts in the in the sc- uh, schools. So at the younger level for these kids because of the bad STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. So by the time you're at the university level, the majority of people that are learning, and you're an engineer, so I'm sure you saw this or at least started to see this decades ago. But nowadays here in the United States, yeah, our universities are considered high level for science, engineer, technology, engineering, math, but they're not Americans who are going to these universities and getting those degrees. It's people from China, people from India, people from uh, South Korea, Japan, other countries. It's not Americans who have gone up through all the government school systems testing high levels of science and math that are graduating from universities and getting those engineering and uh, STEM jobs. Absolutely right. I saw that 20 years ago, uh, all the PhD programs, very few Americans in them um, because we just are not focused. You know, we're we're focused on a lot of youth sports, trying to make our kids pro sports players. And uh, instead of the academics and the rigorous academic, you know, uh, levels that we used to have and our universities have fallen so far. It's quite funny. I always look at the uh, university rankings. And you get a place like Moscow State University, which built the Soviet space program, umpteen Nobel Prize winners, uh, the best technical minds <laughs> coming from all of the fo- Russia and this fom- former Soviet states, and they're ranked below Purdue. It's like, come on, guys, they, well, what's going on with these rankings? So, um, yeah, the, it's a, it's really a culture shift that we've got to like go, uh oh, what happened? Wake up and get things restarted before all this mountain of uh, debt and fake economy collapses completely on us. So, looks would, to be no. so would you say that uh, Chinese manufacturing is actually progressing well from going from making cheap goods that get sold at Target or Walmart or an Amazon to actually like really good value added manufacturing stuff? So durable goods that actually will last a long time. Absolutely. I uh, Late 90s, you're talking about China couldn't make anything. They couldn't make a car themselves, a decent car. No way. Like that was, you know, part of, I've, I've, visited, I've been in over 200 Chinese manufacturing plants. Part of my job was, you know, uh, rebuilding the building plants in China. I built over 15 plants in China. Um, and they just went up the learning curve so fast. Okay. Because they had all that human talent that they educated versus education. You got to focus on the reading and writing and arithmetic. So many people came into STEM fields, technical schools, is you know, and uh, very capitalist mindset. The Chinese are better capitalists than we are. People don't realize that economically, economically, it's capitalist. Politically, it's communist. But yeah, they've they've gone up so far up the value chain that they are now beating our brains in techno- technologically speaking. You saw the big news recently, the Huawei came out. They've got a 5G modem chip in their phones that Apple couldn't do. And that makes sense because Huawei's dominating 5G. They have 50,000 foreign engineers, a lot of them in Europe. Um, they control the 5G space, right? We don't even have 5G here. We pretend. We increased our 4G like 20%, and then we call it 5G. It's a marketing gimmick. OK, so you've got companies like Huawei, you've got companies, BRN, which is now competing with NVIDIA. They've got 50 percent of the data center space in China. They're going to come after NVIDIA. You had the, the semiconductor news break this week. Despite sanctions, they can Huawei relaunched their phones with a seven uh, nanometer chip. OK, that we can't even make that. That's Taiwanese tech from uh, for us. Intel, best they can do is like 12. So they're they're ahead of us. You go anyone that's been to China will tell you it's far more advanced in the high speed rail, the 
the just everything is mobile, the digital payments. I mean, it's just um, it. you go to the cities. It looks like a future modern city. And you look at our cities and they're just dilapidated. They haven't changed in 30, 40 years. So I want to transition now to the housing bubble. So uh, I think you said uh, earlier in the interview that there was actually the need for a lot of new housing in China. But don't you think that it has been overdone, that there's misallocation of capital there? And it it appears over the last really, I I would say, really since 2009, when interest rates went artificially cheap and there was like all these central banks started flooding currency, that there was a lot of speculation then on higher real estate prices in China. And that caused what an enormous bubble from around 2009 to 2019 or so. Yeah. So a few things on the property market, something I've been heavily involved in since 2001. I was one of the first people that could buy up. First time they changed the rules, foreigners could buy. I got in the market. So I've been in the market a long time. And uh, I can tell you, so there's a lot of things going on in the whole property. I've told people from 2001, it's not a bubble. Okay. And I was right. I told people starting back about 18 months ago that now it's over. Okay. The the real estate market's over. And it's going to be a long structural change that has to happen. So what's going on? A lot of things go behind the scenes on these real estate companies people don't realize. Give you example, Greenland, Greenland Holdings, big company out of Shanghai. Uh, you know, your Western Press will report all their bank, they're going bankrupt. They're losing. Yeah, of course, because they're partially owned by Jiang Zemin's family, which is now the enemies of Xi Jinping. So Xi Jinping is going after these big political CPC families, which, which were heavily corrupt which use their leverage and their 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 backgrounds to build huge business empires, right? There's estimated 50 billionaires in the Politburo, Chinese Politburo. So these guys, these billionaire families, they're going after them. So for Greenland, companies like Greenland, they just cut their credit. And as a real estate developer, without credit, you're done. So they're basically done. That doesn't mean the housing market was good. The housing market's terrible. I'll tell you about that in a second. But the Companies like so when you read these things about Greenland, that's what's going behind the scenes. China's trying to crush the real estate market because it's been out of control. There's 38 trillion dollars now in home equity built up in Chinese apartments. Okay, if you bought an apartment in China in Shanghai in 2001, it was seventy thousand dollars. That same apartment's over two million right now. That's in 20 years, uh, and this is city after city. So. Did they build too many? Absolutely, especially the tier three cities, tier four cities, these tiny towns. I know, like for instance, Taizhou right now, it's a town of 800,000 people. They have 12,000 apartments for sale. Okay, nobody's going to buy them because the the demographics are so bad. This is a generational shift. We had a 20 year boom. Okay, you could say it's a bubble. It wasn't really a bubble. I mean, we the need of the apartments, the living standards were terrible pre year 2000. Okay. Now everyone's got these nice new apartments and condos and, and subway stations and all this. Everything's built up beautiful, you know. But there's too many now apartments and the demographics is horrible, you know. So the real the real birth rate's probably 0.7, something similar to South Korea. Officially it's 1.3. So they have a demographic demographic death spiral, which won't crush the economy, but it's not great for housing, right? There's nobody to take these places. So your tier one cities, Shanghai, your Beijing, your Guangzhou, they're going to be fine. People keep wanting to move into those cities. It's like New York City, right? People just keep wanting to move into those tier one cities. But your tier two, tier three, tier three, tier four, they have to get, there's going to be some bailouts, no doubt about it. How big the bailouts are, it's hard to say, but the Chinese government seems pretty adept. They have so much financial control, including the banks. They don't, the banks don't get it with nothing over there. So they have such strict control over the state owned banks. They'll probably be able to, you know, underwrite all the the debt restructuring of this. But going forward, I think there'll be a generational shift in Chinese minds that you can't make money in housing anymore. And this has been part of the demographic crisis. No one, young people can afford apartments. So that's why the CPC wants to crush housing prices. Okay. They don't want $2 million apartments, $3 million apartments that nobody will ever be able to afford. So that's what's going on in the real estate. It's a, it's bad. It's down 10 to 15% tier one cities, 30% in lower tier cities, and nobody wants them. Nobody's buying. Okay. But does it mean an apocalypse? Probably not. It's probably going to get debt worked out, get their, you know, they'll get their debt worked out over time. 
So what happened in the United States, we had similar stuff in the United States, in New York City decades ago, in Miami decades ago, these eventually did recover. So there was uh, real estate booms and busts in the past in the United States, whether it was commercial real estate, and you had a bunch of real estate developers with Donald Trump and many others, what in the 80s and 90s, Sam Zell, uh, the casino guy, Steve Wynn and Sheldon Adelson, people forget about this many, many decades ago, there was enormous commercial real estate bus eventually recovered. You had residential real estate bus and high-end condo bus in Miami, what, 2008, 2009, that recovered. Now, tons of Americans want to move down to Miami and real estate prices have recovered. So we could see that. What worries me, Dan, though, is that a lot of people right now in China are upside down on their mortgages. So they some of them have some negative equity. Um, there's no strategic defaults like there is here in the United States. And then that means potentially if real estate prices keep falling in China, the banks then would be in trouble because they ha are holding, maybe they end up with um, upside down mortgages or mortgages people can't pay or something like that. And then the banks then start getting balance sheet problems. And then you're, you're starting to look at what the central bank and the government having to bail out the banks as a kind of a cascade effect with the amount of loans that were uh, pledged as collateral uh, with the high real estate prices in their uh, Chinese banking system, their shadow banking. Well, it didn't their credit, their total credit, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it went from 2000, in 2007, it was China's economy, their private sector had, I think, under 2 trillion of total credit inside their domestic economy. And then it got up to almost 50 trillion by 2019 with the excesses of the property bubble at the end. Yeah, so on the, on the property, you're not upside down unless you bought, say, from 2019, but... Yeah, anyone after 2019, Chinese are not used to being upside down on mortgages. So, and in, in my days, they never even used to have a mortgage. So, from 2000 to 2015, 2012, probably, it's all cash. People just buy cash. If they got a mortgage, it was a small mortgage. Then they went because prices got so high, they got to mortgages, both parents putting in money for the kid to get the down payment. And so, yeah, after 2019 or 2020, it's probably upside down. But then there's some people that'll come in the market that, the Chinese money, uh, they have so much money and cash on hand. You know, they're very cash rich. Like I said, in the housing market, there's $38 trillion in home equity. So if I have my Shanghai apartment and I bought it at $100,000 and it's now worth $2 million, if it goes down 20%, you don't have a problem. Okay. Yeah, un unless you borrowed against it. So unless you open up a business or your uh, credit yeah. card debt or you start borrowing against the yeah, there's very little. Yeah, but that's not that's not really a China model. There's very little of that home refinancing and things like that. It's just not common. So um, I don't see that cascading like it would in the U.S. So I'm not saying it's a great. It's a it's a situation. It's a you know, there's cyclical issues and there's structural issues. So cyclical. The big problem China's got now is covid. All right. People are shell shocked from COVID. So U.S. printed nine, seven to nine trillion for COVID. Right. China didn't print anything. So if you're in a if you got a restaurant, you're just out of business or if you got a small business. You're just out of business. So the economy today, it's shell shocked from that. And it's getting harder. It's hard to recover. You got the export markets terrible, but it's terrible for everybody. South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, it's all down 20 percent. Global shipping rates are the lowest in decades. U.S. domestic trucking is lowest in decades. That tells you our economy is terrible. It's a mass depression and just going to get worse. But within China, the um, I don't you know, they, they've got the home equity there. But I, the economy, as I mentioned, it's bad. I know people that have owned factories that haven't had orders the, like most of the year. Like they're just like they've been on vacation since March. And it's like, yeah, I'm waiting for orders. So there, it's not great, but it's a COVID shell shock. And then some of the structural issues, which you correctly point out, housing is obviously one um, that's going to come down and it's going to have to get debt rework. It may help with the demographic issue, make younger people have a chance to get on the property ladder. But um, so those structural issues, I think China's in for a five year restructuring period domestically. There's no doubt about it. Do you expect then the other real estate developers, uh, Country Garden, some of these others, do you expect then to go bankrupt? And then the executives, I think recently this week, we had the CEO of Evergrande, the Chinese government's going after him. But there's videos showing and there's like insider testimony and others that there was tons of bribes being paid along the way. Evergrande had Chinese government officials on their payroll to look the other way. And I think what wasn't Evergrande taking down payments five, seven years ago for Chinese uh, for Chinese people for luxury condos, and they still haven't even started construction on these homes or luxury condos. 
Yeah, I don't. There's a lot of unfinished homes. I don't know if it's five or seven years. That's a little bit. That it, you know, I don't know if it's that bad. It might be bad because of COVID. But normally, China builds these things in at 18 months. I mean, they're incredible at building this stuff. Um, as I mentioned, the Greenland guy is the Jiang Zemin cohort, right? They all run in these political nexuses and networks. And the Jiang Zemin family, Hu Jintao, and those guys got taken down. Saw that saw that at the CPC leadership meeting where they escorted them out. And then when your big guy falls, there's just a cascade of everyone beneath them. And that's what's happening in the Evergrande. So it depends on who's the owners of these companies. The Evergrande guy got arrested because he claimed bankruptcy in U.S. courts. So that he's trying to shield their assets from China, from the Chinese government. So that's why he got arrested. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fight, man. It's going to be, you know, it's, there's a lot of politics behind the scenes. Because when you talk about those big state-owned, when you get into multi-billion dollar companies, there's a lot of political heavyweights that are backing these things. And as I tell people like Huawei, you don't even know who owns Huawei, right? There's a front guy that owns 1%. And then there's 99% owned by a labor union that is for sure owned by a bunch of political families. So um, yeah, they, you know, they're big heavyweights in the economy. So there's always a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Um, but Greenland left a mess. What will happen is the regional governments all take over the properties and they'll get them finished. But the question is, is there even a demand for some of these? There's really not in a lot of these in a lot of these cities. Well, there's also trillions of bad debt from local government financing vehicles. So I'm not really sure how the Chinese government and their central bank, the People's Bank of China, are going to handle that. But could you talk then about changes to the Chinese economy since Xi Jinping took over? Did he actually get rid of corruption? Did he just take out his political enemies? Did he steal hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of wealth for his family? Um, it, did their did their uh, policy towards foreign business owners and foreigners coming to China and say opening up um, a franchise restaurant and not being kicked out or having their business stolen or stuff like that? Because the Wall Street Journal was running articles on this over the last three, four, five years. Um, could you just talk about the changes to the Chinese economy since Xi Jinping took over? Yeah, so um, the answer to the first few questions, yes and yes. Yeah, he took he got rid of his enemies at the same time at clamping down on corruption. So when he came into power, I still remember it well. That was right about the time of the Snowden leaks as well. And the Chinese government was shocked at how much U.S. intelligence was working and had embedded systems with the U.S. tech firms. That's when Cisco got dumped out of China, losing hundreds of billions of dollars. Just like most other companies, uh, American companies that have built up huge market positions in China are going to get dumped if we keep the geopolitical relationship going as it is. But there was absolutely a big crackdown on corruption. Like literally, if you if you're a Beijing government official, if you didn't know that guy 10 years, he ain't even going to dinner with you anymore. Whereas before she, it was just the wild west. I knew guys that would spend five thousand dollars at dinner, just expense it, a local government guy. Um, you know, you know, like the equivalent why of a, to get information or to get a government contract or why? His cousin owned the restaurant or whoever. Oh, you know so I mean? so he it was a family. government official who would go to his uh family member's restaurant and expense it on the taxpayer's dime. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, there's just there was a million and one shady things going on when you get that kind of a booming economy and everything's go, go, go. You know, there's just and the government and the government was out of control. And that's when she put in what they policy they call. I'm going to go after the dragons and the flies, like even down to the littlest, most corrupt guy. You see, And now you look at the U.S. and we have we kind of need the same kind of policy pretty much. But it was another topic for another day. But um, well, yeah, you got so the white were, collar criminal. You got the white collar criminal lawyers here in D.C. Um, doing even more corruption, spending trillions of dollars and stealing as much as they can and doing insider stock trades. <laughs> Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And, you you know, it's craziness. So um, look at the FTX Ponzi, hundreds of billions of dollars stolen, then donated to the Democratic Party. And they just, you know, the guy's like walking around. So anyway, I, uh, it's off topic. Same but, thing for yeah, John so Corzine. Yeah, John Corzine, too. No prison time. <laughs> it raises more money, right? <laughs> yeah, he's buddies Sorry, with Obama, money. former Goldman Sachs and uh, DNC fundraiser, one of the top ones. Yeah. It's bad, man. It's a, it's too depressing. But um, China, yeah, he clamped down on corruption. Not that it doesn't still go on. It probably, you know, it, it's very difficult to once that kind of, you know, all corruption comes out of the communist systems because in communism, you couldn't get anything done unless you're corrupt. 
unless you know you, everything functioned as a black market, right? Trade this, trade that. That's very hard to get rid of, but they've done a really good job. Uh, back to your question on the foreign thing, uh, China clamped down heavily on foreigners. The times I was living full time in Shanghai, we had two hundred thousand foreigners there at all at, at any one time, living there, working. And then we had a big influx of just people hopping around doing nothing, te- teaching English, just whatever. And they clamped down and sent a lot of those guys back. So that's the, the, one of the big hurdles of the Chinese economy, which I didn't mention, is that that was a $800 billion tourism market in China. There were 324 weekly flights from U.S. to China pre-COVID. Today, there's still only like 24 flights weekly to China. Nobody's going. So it's like a trillion dollar tourism market gone. So they only have domestic tourism left. So um, it, it, we're still waiting to see if we re-engaged China's going to re-engage with the world or we can go back to normal or we can't go back to normal. It's a, well, it's a the, weird the thing tra- that's happened. The trade terms really since Trump have gotten very, very hostile. So I remember Trump when he was running, he was talking, threatening about raising tariffs on all Chinese manufactured goods. And I, tons and tons of people didn't think he would do it. I was interviewing former U.S. Treasury, the undersecretary, Paul Craig Roberts, and he was adamant Trump would never do it. And then Trump did it. And then it, I, what didn't it hurt a lot of the the uh, cheaper goods that were the uh, Chinese manufacturers were making for Target, Walmart, those guys didn't it almost bankrupt a lot of those guys in a couple of year span. So yeah, that's called Section three hundred one of China tariff, which basically adds twenty five percent onto whatever existing tariff there was. I was in favor of this. Okay, you have to realize China is not a free market. It's it, there's parts of the economy that are free market, and there are parts that are state owned. And there's parts that you'll never compete against, like renewables and EVs, because so much money is flooded into these companies from government sources. So, like, say, for Geely, when they bought Volvo, they paid $2 billion. That was worth 10 times what Geely was worth itself. So that would never happen under a capitalist system. Same with the EVs. They've just flooded these companies with so much free money to build the EV base. You can't compete with it. So you have to be smart and target some kind of protection for your companies uh, when you're not competing against non-capitalist, non-free market company countries. So yes, it's the it's still on. Biden kept the tariff on. Most of what you see now in the trade data is China went from uh, no longer our number one trading partner because they've all moved the facilities into Mexico or Thailand or Vietnam and then reroute the trade goods through those countries into the United States, getting around the tariffs. <laughs> so so the goods coming into Mexico have skyrocketed. Same with Vietnam, Thailand, but they're not from Mexican manufacturers. They're just Chinese warehouses taking in the goods and reshipping. Because anyone oh, that's really injured, so it's still oh, from China, so then it's rerouted. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. So Peter yeah. Zihan, have you seen like the presentations that uh Peter Zihan has been talking yeah. about for the last couple of years? Yeah, him and I fight on China all the time because he has no idea what he's talking about. He's completely fucking clueless. And um, well, yeah, Stratford, are, are you aware that Stratford, like a lot of their funding is from like uh, intelligence agencies here in the United of States? Course. Like that's, a- Of course, he's a deep state shill. It's just war after war. Let's do it. Let's let's go into another trillion dollar debacle. Where can we find the next trillion dollar do- debacle to piss away money? He doesn't know anything about China. He's never been there. He doesn't speak the language. And I always tell people, imagine you're looking for your China, your American expert, your China think tank. Where can I find my American expert? Oh, there's a guy in Hunan province, never been to America, doesn't speak English, can't consume their media, uh, doesn't know, never been to America. He's my American expert I'm going to listen to. Come on. That's exactly what you're doing with these deep state, deep state shill guys like Zahan. When it's, Zahan was in Stratfor, he predicted the end of China 15 years ago, and he's been doing it every year since. And, and he makes really- he makes like seven or eight figures a year with speaking engagements and consulting fees and new books. I'm right. not saying he's wrong about everything, but I mean, like right. some of his big predictions have been really, really off. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, OK, his demographic demographic stuff is interesting, but his actually on the ground understanding how this is a guy who's never had a real job. OK, you go from college into a thing. that's like most people in D.C., though, <laughs> <laughs> they're they're making six, sure. seven figures here. Most of most of them are kind of like Bernie Sanders or they're from a trust fund or a rich family. Yeah, their their parents are still some of them are like 30, 40 years old and their parents bought them a two million condo wired the money here. Yeah. If you've never employed someone or run a business or, 
you know, actually imported or exported something or at least been to China, you can't really be an expert on a real economy. So he's, I mean, he's really clueless and really does a disservice. Like my, I always question, like, if these guys are national security guys, why would you, and he's along with Gordon Chong, who also predicted the end of China in 2001. And the economy's up 20 times since then. Like if you're if you're such a national security guy, why do you keep underestimating China and they just keep making you look stupid? So it's just it's just ridiculous. Like they've totally been unprepared, and now here we are. We can't make a ship. We make the same amount of cars we did in 1970. You know they're beating us in 5G. They're beating us in EVs. You know Ford and Tesla both have asked Cattle, the Chinese battery maker, to come here set up a plant because we don't have lithium ion phosphate ev battery technology um and it's just going to get worse and worse we don't make chemicals we don't make i mean it's just incredible so um it's we're like a heroin addict coming off cheap free printed money over 30 years and it's like we finally need a few slaps in the face to wake up and change our our modus operandi <laughs> Well, every infrastructure bill that's passed here, Dan, and I've lived in D.C. for over 20 years now, every single one of the infrastructure bills, all the almost all the money is either wasted or stolen or used for bailouts or given as like a corporate subsidy. It's not actually used for the infrastructure. Then you right. have something like the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed recently. And on the face of the bill, they're claiming it's um, only one point one trillion of spending. What the average person doesn't know is that about 70 percent of the Green New Deal, the spending was stuck in and the spending on the face of the bill is nothing compared to what the real amount's going to be. It's going to be at least three times that worth of Green New Deal spending. You're absolutely right. So here's one thing I point out with, you know, we had the big all the issue with the ports and some of my companies, we you know, we have something coming on a plane or boat every day, every week. And uh we, the port, you know, we ran these port issues. It takes us a week, two weeks to unload and get something on a truck. Okay. That's in a good day, good times. China does it in 24 hours. Okay. Even less than that. Everything's automated is, is completely automated, computerized. And you look at our ports, it, they haven't changed from the seventies. They're exactly the same. So we pass. we know we got this problem. We pass a $50 billion allocation in the build back better bill for ports. Okay. We're going to get our ports back. And as you correctly point out, the it sounds good. And then what sounds is good consulting. is marketing versus reality. It's for consulting studies. Like they're not building anything. Singapore went for 50 billion and built a world-class state-of-the-art port. So instead of using the money so to you're build saying the like Booz Allen Hamilton and some of these other consulting companies, and there's six or seven big ones here in the DC metro area that are making billions of dollars. You're saying they just uh, they put stuff into the bill and then just made it for profits, overcharged the fees, and then it wasn't actually used for anything that was useful. Yeah, it's it's 50 billion to tell us what to do about the ports instead of just build the goddamn ports. You know, it's a craziness. Uh, yeah, there's thinking. so much waste. I, I just say there's just so much waste, fraud, corruption and abuse. I don't think it can continue for that much longer. But here yeah. we are 15 years later after the 2008 financial crisis. Although I would argue that a lot of those dollars that the Fed did print since 2008, a lot of it was exported. It was put into asset prices and stocks, bonds, real estate. And then uh, the foreigners were buying U.S. Treasuries for a while, but that appears to have stopped now. That's died. And China has been hasn't added to their they're stashed at T-bills for five, six years now. And now they're going down. You know, now they're declining every month. Um, yeah, there's no foreigners by the debt. And as you said, I think we both had the same mindset on this stuff 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And it has lasted longer than people would expect. But uh, we're now at the tipping point, right? So trillion dollar annual and interest well, expense. Well, if 30% if of that debt to get rolled over in, in, a, month, in a year. You're looking at a $2 trillion in interest payments. Our budget was $4 trillion in 2019. So we're looking like we're spiraling out of control. Well, I think what you're, you're seeing this in the data now. If you're a foreign government and your country is running a trade surplus with the United States, you have foreign exchange reserves with a base accumulated trade surpluses. Instead of buying, quote unquote, U.S. Treasuries risk-free, what, at 4.5%, depending upon what length of treasury you want to get, you're seeing these governments, they're buying net tonnage of gold. And if you're China, you can't go out and buy that much gold or you're going to move the gold price too much too quickly. Instead, it's just cheaper and easier to build the new strategic petroleum reserve. And I think China has at least five or six and then go and build a new giant warehouse and fill it to the brim with copper. 
Absolutely. That's what I mean, the whole idea around BRICS idea was is mainly a geopolitical one, but it was also to export a lot of that production capacity. Instead of buy treasury bills, let's go build phone networks and bridges and ports and all this. And then we expand our global reach, you know, and partnerships with through the BRICS. But that yeah, that'll just continue. They'll stockpile more stuff. They still have a trillion. Their tr- trade surplus is still like a trillion dollars. It's higher than ever. Um it's just it's well it's what, what can they what can they if they're not buying treasuries they don't have that many options then right so they can either buy gold tonnage or they can buy commodities and if they're not going to buy treasuries that's a great question so and it's a great insight because how you get wealth in china has always been follow where the chinese money will go next where is it going into properties and going to stocks went into stocks crash it died never it went into property it stayed there that's going to go out if you can find where the money's going to flow to next out of China, because there's so much of it, you're talking, you know, 60 trillion, 70 trillion dollars, where that goes next, that's going to be the next big thing. <laughs> and there's not a lot to invest in. You're right. I mean, there, a lot of those funds are locked up in mainland with only a few escape valves, you know, via Macau or Hong Kong or things. But yeah, I also I'm, I'm I need to look into more where that will go. But um, I know a lot of money wants to get out right now. Well, sure. well, I, I, actually, we need to separate that out. So I was talking at the government level, what the government and central banks can do with those massive trade surpluses and foreign exchange reserves. And you were talking about private sector. So if yeah. you're a private sector Chinese person, you have capital for our listeners out there who aren't aware. You have tremendous capital control. So let's say you're a pretty successful small business owner or upper middle class, or or a little bit higher than that Chinese family, and you have a couple million dollars in savings, you might not be able to get all of your savings out via the capital control. So you have limited investment choices. Like Dan was saying, for years, a lot of Chinese, maybe instead of putting all the savings into a bank, they bought real estate. But now that real estate's not looking like a good option, where do you think that their investments and savings are going to go instead? Yeah, it's a good question. I I, I honestly don't know. Um, You know, could go into metals, could go into gold. Um, that wouldn't surprise, it wouldn't surprise me if they just buy, you know, gold is offered at every state owned bank, you know, retail outlet, uh, gold bars. So I wouldn't surprise silver bars. Um, yeah, we'll see where their next bubble goes. Um, I don't have a read on where that's going to go. So I think we're, we're right now, everything's kind of imploding. So you're not going to see the money go out. Everything's contracting. So once that stabilizes, then we'll see, see where the money goes. It'll be interesting. But you think if the Chinese currency, so they're running a dollar peg for our listeners out there, but the Chinese central bank keeps it in a range. But let's say the currency does start to devalue. Let's say we see eight Chinese yuan to the dollar or some type of um, near term devaluation of the currency that's more than expected. Do you expect then that Chinese people wouldn't hold the cash? They're going to try to either pay a money laundering fee to get the currency out into other currencies to go buy U.S. stocks or foreign real estate. They were doing this in the past, obviously, but maybe if the currency is being devalued, there's more of a panic to do that. Or do you think then that we're going to see, and we're starting to see this in the data already, that people in mainland China are going to buy physical gold and pay a high premium then? Yeah, so the the RMB rates from 7 to 8 wouldn't bother me. It's traditionally been like 7.3. It's been It's now fixed to a basket of international cur- currency, mostly dollar, euro, yen. It will continue to slide down most likely. It just makes Chinese manufacturers more profitable. Um, where uh, what what they decide, to, I don't think there'll be a panic. Even so, as you mentioned, well, there is big capital controls. You can only move about fifty thousand a year. But if you have companies, you can wire, you know, as much as you want. So I've wired millions of dollars to China through my, with my companies. So and and uh, back, so, back and forth or from. Uh, back and China- forth. Oh, okay. Because I've I've heard yeah, stories that it's harder to get the capital out of mainland China, especially dollars, because they want to keep a lot of dollars inside China. There's a lot yeah, of dollar tsunami debt inside China. Yeah, you can't just go transfer a million dollar in your USD savings account out of your Shanghai bank. No. But what a lot of in entrepreneurs or business people do is you're constantly, you know, if you're exporting something, you're paying for something. So they they can get money out that way. There's a lot of people that will move money out that way. Then there's Macau and Hong Kong. I would expect, you and know, Singapore, in, yeah, Singapore. In Singapore, too. I would expect that the economy has gotten so bad now that she will kind of take a heavy hand off of the economy and let it kind of go back, not to the crazy heydays, but will let some of that leak out again. Um, 
I think it also depends on geopolitical situation. So China has been pulling back geopolitically. They're not investing uh, overseas as much just because of the geopolitical relationships, you know, so they don't want to own U.S. companies and then get get it, whatever, take well, it away. For our listeners out there, there's backlash. So you're seeing this now in whether it's the LA T- Los Angeles Times or others where Chinese property developers were trying to buy buildings and then redevelop them or for whatever purposes. And now you're seeing the local politicians, especially here in the polling. It's actually one of the only issues I think that Republicans and Democrats, according to the polling uh, Americans agree on, is there's a lot of anti-China policy now from many Americans. It's like one of the only issues I think where the polling is is pretty close for both political parties is very anti-China policy now here in the United States. That is, yeah, that's interesting. I, I would say that and more wars for Ukraine. Uh, are probably the closest thing both sides can agree on, which is crazy. The problem with China is that I think it's like the seven steps where in anger and denial, we're in the anger phase now of waking up and realizing, oh my God, China's built a better economy than we have. They're technically ahead of us. The military, the military guys are shocked. And I was talking about this for 10 years, but now you realize their Navy is already 30% larger than our Navy. And it's going to be twice the size of our Navy in five years um they are a you know they're putting you know probes around the moon this is a highly technically sophisticated economy and they know how to get things done they're taking over markets all over the world they've replaced japan this year as the world's largest car exporter well well, Um, by taking over the markets i think a key thing here and this is commodities driven is china is basically negotiating a lot um with a lot of uh, countries whether that's like iran iraq Saudi Arabia for pipelines, uh, fertilizer, uh, exclusive agreements for natural gas, uh, Venezuela. China's negotiating kind of exclusive commodities deals, long-term contracts to where like if the U.S. um, has commodity supply problems, they can't go to any of these other countries and get those commodities because China already has negotiated long-term contracts for them. Yeah, that's a good point. So the the key there is China and Russia combined are running the global south as we call it. So we have US and Europe, both aging economies with no productive capacity left anymore. Europe's dead in the water with their gas prices now. And the China and Russia's engulfing the rest of the world, and they're going to be running the show through commodities. And Russia's the muscle, and China's the money. And so, yeah, absolutely. China, China's everyone's number one trade partner. You know, where's the copper from Chile going to go? It's going to China. Where's the soybeans from Brazil going to go? They're going to China. So Indonesia, where's the nickel going? They're going to Chinese EV battery plants, not us. We don't make enough EVs yet. So, yeah, they are doing a geopolitical coup. And with our brilliant foreign policy guys in D.C., they have we have now pushed China and Russia together because we refuse to coexist with these people as normal countries. So now we have a geopolitical block forming around us of China plus Russia plus BRICS plus the entire global self. And these are exclusive commodities contracts. So if the U.S. gets in a bind with oil and let's say Biden goes on his knees to Saudis or Biden goes to Venezuela to ask for more oil, there's not going to be oil there. And the terms are going to be bad if there's any supply available because China already has taken up long term supply agreements with a lot of the supply. This is what the Chinese have been working on behind the scenes for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Absolutely. And not only that, but it gets worse. They, we can't reprocess any of this stuff, even if we could get it. So it has to go back to China anyway to get reprocessed. Oh, and then if it wants to get put in a final good, that's go to China anyway, because that's what they make. Wait, we don't you're make- talking manufacturing because the U.S. obviously has really good oil refineries still, though we can't build any more new ones. We Our old ones are still pretty good. Yeah, that's oil. I was talking more on the metal side, rare earths, galliums, lithium. Oh, know. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. But but to your point on the oil, yeah, we built one new refinery since 1976. And we wonder why ga- our gas prices are high. But back on to the, uh, the, the metals, they, you know, they block gallium and germanium, right? These are two materials actually I deal with in some of my companies. These are needed by the most next advanced semiconductors, okay? They are 10 times what silicon can do. And right now, one of our leading companies here is the world leader, but China has blocked that material. And this is heavy, heavy for military usage as well. They've now blocked the material. They said, you're going to block semiconductor machines from us. All right, we're going to block this raw materials from you. And now 
you know, you sprinkle some of this gallium on all semiconductors. Like we're in deep, deep trouble on a lot of this stuff. So, oh, uh, you have to be super technical to do the rare earth value chain. It is very difficult. There's not many companies that can do it. I mean, just mining the rare earths is an enormous pain in the ass. Yeah, they're they're not high grade and it's difficult, but you're using a lot of people aren't aware of this. There's tons of radioactive byproduct with the rare earths and then yep. just separating them out for stuff that's usable, getting them into powders and yep. then all the value added chain to get them to rare earth permanent magnets and all the other products you need for advanced technology and and all right. the green energy, all that stuff. It's just super, super complex. You need PhD level STEM yep. technology. You're absolutely right. It's, it is toxic. You're taking out 100 tons of ore to get a kg of material. And then even if you have the material, which we don't have, we don't have heavy rare earth. We have light rare earth at Molycorp. Um, we used to be Molycorp. I don't even know what it's named now. But, I, uh, I think it's M yeah. M MMP metals. And so like, uh, but uh, Neil Performance Materials actually had a bankruptcy. So they're Canadian, but they have, uh, f they have facilities in China. They do actually in the Western world, they have the best facilities. They're on the... Uh, Toronto Stock Exchange, Neo Performance Materials out there. They have like deals with Honda. They're doing, they have thousands and thousands of patents and intellectual property. But they also have, uh, I think they have like one of the only export licenses in China as a foreign company. Okay, right. So the rare earth, I mean, not to go too much into history, but we used to control that with a plant in Kokomo, Indiana, which we ended up selling to China. China was very smart. But as you mentioned, the, the processing of these is highly toxic highly complex so even but even if you're to process it where is it going to go it's going to a magnet manufacturer oh they're all in china so or japan yeah or germany yeah so this is not really in the united States. there's uh there's mostly in china but you also have some in the other manufacturing powerhouses like germany japan south korea it's not in the U u.s though <laughs> no exactly and germany you can almost call an x powerhouse they're declining fast in japan as well japan a lot of the rare earth is more to do with japan and also the the gallium and germanium is also with japan that's it with their you know but the the tra as the trade wars heat up this is just getting crazy because we're hurting everybody across the world like uh, we have to be able to make stuff we have to we have this as i mentioned the denial phase of american china relationship we need to realize all right they did this we're worried we're we're, worried, we're trying to hold them back instead of rebuilding ourselves Okay, the tariffs are one thing, but it's at, you have to go industry by industry, ask the questions, what the hell happened? Why can't we build a ship? Why are we building the same number of cars we did in 1970? Why have we not built a new oil refinery since 1976? What's going on? So there's a lot of a lot of this is related to the money printing. Everybody went into speculation, right? You, you could just make an easy buck in speculation. Well, don't, don't get me started on the private equity guys and their, I mean, how they destroy companies and values and extract it all you know but you know yeah, this we're is talking about this venture capital private equity hedge funds um tons of waste fraud corruption and abuse since 2008 it was the cancel on effect people aren't aware of this 33 trillion dollars in stock market cap was added to the u.s stock markets since 2009 and a lot of it was all the central bank currency creation with bailout money and money printing quantitative easing it wasn't just the federal reserve bank it was other countries that ended up here in the united states so that money wasn't used productively. If you own the stocks and the bonds and the real estate, that was good for you, but it wasn't used on actual stuff, improving the economy, creating jobs, new products and services, fixing infrastructure. It wasn't used on any of that. Right. Absolutely. It's crazy. And I wish pe people need to wake up to this point. I mean, they we have to get a grip on the money printing and realize what it's done, right? the, the corrosive effects of this, you know, and, and how it has crowded out real economy, real production. And, you know, similar to the military issue, we talked a little bit about you'll never keep a top tier military without a top tier real economy. If you don't make steel, you don't make commercial ships, eventually you use you lose the capabilities on the military side. Case in point, the LCS littoral combat system ships, which last nine years, we're not we're now sink. We're now taking them. We're 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 scrapping them now in seven to nine years. It lasts less than a Hyundai Kia. You know, we spent billions of dollars on this program and it's terrible. It, it, it's so maintenance heavy. And well, the, the U.S. is also reliant on a lot of Chinese manufacturers for a lot of the parts and assemblies. So, yeah. Yeah. Raytheon, the CEO of Raytheon said, you can't stop buying from China. I'm sorry. We, <laughs> so we we need to buy time with China. We need to say coexist. And they're not 
militarily aggressive per se. They you you haven't seen. I mean, if you were to say country A and country B, China versus the United States, take the name off them and look at the list of wars over the last fifty years, you're going to be more afraid of the United States than you're on China. Um, you need to coexist with them and rebuild our industrial base at the same time and our technical base. I mean, it needs a whole culture rethink. And going back to what we just talked about, like how is your capitalist system functioning on this free printed money and this venture capital nonsense and private capital nonsense, private equity? I mean, uh, you know, it, it, the whole system needs a reboot. And if you don't look at the whole system, you can do the chips bill, which I think is a good idea. We can do that. We can reindustrialize like more of a state model trying to push industries. But without looking at the whole system and what causes to get here, nothing will change. Well, Foxconn tried to open a factory in Wisconsin, and that was not profitable, and there was tons of waste with it. So even when they try to build, uh, bring a factory back here in the United States, there's still tons of waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse, and things do not work out like what was planned. Absolutely, and you're getting sued for stupid stuff, you know. And someone said a comment, and your next thing you know, you're getting sued. Um, it's th- th- that's part of the whole system rot that needs to be looked at. You know, um, it can be done. I would say. Look at what Elon Musk has done. It's incredible. You know, EV, space company, artificial intelligence. What he's shown is the path forward to reindustrialization, which is small, highly capable skunk work like operations and teams. I mean, these like these guys in Detroit, they're dinosaurs making cars. They're they're dead and they don't they're walking dead. They don't know it. But what he's and doing. And they can't make. Well, so they make the let me here add to your points here in Detroit. So. They're still making lots of money off sport utility vehicles. Those are their most profitable entity there. Every time they make electric cars, they lose tons of money in Detroit. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Because there's specifics within the EV versus the ICE issues. Um, If you're Tesla, you're just running an EV company. If you're Ford or GM, you're running an EV company and an ICE company. That's how difficult, the different the technologies are. But the EVs have about 40% less parts and and it takes about 40 percent less labor to assemble them that's why you saw tesla was able to do a big cost reduction the the ev and what you're seeing out of china now is scaring the hell out of everybody germany us they're coming out with beautiful nice evs at twelve thousand bucks okay six through 400 mile ranges so um yeah they're nowhere near that here in the united states i mean i guess you can maybe get a bare bone tesla one for 35 but i mean that thing might break down i mean a, a halfway decent electric vehicle here in the united states at least 70 85000 dollars and then there's issues with the infrastructure with charging it and then these sure. these things break down they don't work in hot and cold weather too well and then yep. if you're p- plugging what using the air conditioning or the heat or plugging electronics into the battery while you're driving the electric vehicle uh, the the battery just doesn't hold as long with the three hundred something miles. It doesn't last as long. It you're, you're, yes, that's correct. But keep in mind, we're moving into more solid state batteries. The technology keeps improving. If you look at a if you look at an ice engine, you're looking at technologies of last century, right? Gears, pulleys, hydraulic fluid, everything's mechanical engineering. Whereas EVs, so many, so imagine there, there's another you know forty percent less parts in an EV. You're talking hundreds of parts that you need in an ice engine that you don't need in an EV. Every one of those parts has three to 500 workers at a factory attached to it. So the EVs have such a cost advantage. At the end of the day, they're not, the ice engines will not be able to survive the price wars. So the problem well, with... The so, you're, so you're saying then that you expect eventually these super high quality electric vehicles, the price of them is going to come down a lot compared to what yeah. they are now. Absolutely. Yep. For sure. Now, unless you run in, so right now they're on a lot of lithium, but I mentioned the Chinese makers have the lithium ion, uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. They're called lamp batteries, a lot, lot less raw, rare earth type stuff, no cobalt, no nickel. Um, then we'll move into solid state, which is already on the proving grounds, which is like hardly any raw materials of the, you know, the real expensive stuff. The cost curve will come down dramatically because that's what UAW is on strike now about. The, the, the big Detroit guys want to go to electric. You need 40 percent less people for that. Right. These are like Lego modules. Well, tech. also their wages, they gave up a lot in the bailouts. Government Motors was in 2008, 2009, although I think the UAW and some of the workers got some of the equity that the pension fund, the bondholders of the, the Indiana pension fund was supposed to get the equity of General Motors back in 2008 because they were the bondholders and they got screwed. 
But then you have all the inflation that's happened, right, for the last uh, years now, and the workers did want higher wages. So, I mean, they um, they did deserve some higher wage. Workers should get some higher wages to offset the inflation. But, yeah. like, uh, I don't know, the way it's been going, it seems like a mess, though. Well, yeah, I mean, I was a GM. I worked for GM for 10 years, so I know it well. And I know I had a lot of friends that got screwed on pensions from them. Um, yeah, I know it well. So they, they put in a the biggest sticking point is they put in a two tier system in t- 2008. So anybody new didn't get a pension. You got a 401k and you were working for like $12 an hour. And they, so the guy on the line next to you doing the same job was making $100,000 and you were making $25,000 for the same damn job. Wow. So it, and that's got, below minimum wage. Oh, it was wow. crazy. You could make more at McDonald's than you can at some parts plants in Michigan. It's that's crazy. Shocking. That's just shocking. Yeah, so they de- absolutely deserve it, uh, increases. I'm for that. This is all caused by the money printing and inflation. But however, the, so the the big sticking point is the pension. No, pensions things are just not sustainable. You can't employ someone for 30 years and pay them for 70. So that's the, you know they got to keep that at the 401k, but they should get a huge increase. Um, but the 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 big the four day work week I think is a gambit. They're not going to stick to that. That's just one of their their uh, negotiation points they throw out. But um, yeah, but fully loaded. If you're talking to accepted the terms they started with, a worker in Detroit would be three hundred thousand a year. Like how are you, you know, that? Yeah, I, you- I'm a free market guy, so I'm not. Um, I mean, if unions want to compete in the free market, so I'm not pro union. I'm right. free market, but I mean, like there has been a lot of inflation, and workers yeah. can demand higher wages. But I mean, like there's going to be businesses that fail if wages go up, or or the consumer. So it's the whole thing is just a mess. Honestly, it was all caused by distortions of 15 years of zero interest rate policy by the Fed. A lot of it, and then there's yep. a lot of waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse out of DC with bad policies, and then at the state, state and local level too. Government just yep. tons of policies that add up and make things a, me- a mess and a nightmare. Yep. No. So the big problem with the the unions, and I'm not a generally not a fan of unions. I could tell you horror stories. I'm from Detroit. <laughs> the uh, the big problem is if you go to the Tesla facilities, non unionized, they can change anything they want. Literally, Elon Musk runs around every operation line, change this, change that, speed it up, speed this, stop, watch it. How long is that taking? Fix that. You can't do any of that at UAW plant. God forbid somebody move you know move something you need less of a worker if you're in an office at a three at a big three company you can't move a cabinet somewhere you have to wait for the UAW guy to come get it wow I, yeah I had a guy so you know, listeners might like this story but so there was a plant in Buffalo New York now closed it's in Mexico but at the plant there was a guy that worked in the elevator he was 400 pounds and the elevator stops and the guy that I my friend got off the elevator he was a plant manager and he's got some boxes in the elevator. This was like a three or four story plant. And he and he's waiting for the elevator. And my friend who's a plant manager looks at him and goes, what are you waiting for? He's like, I can't push the boxes off the elevator. He's like, why not? Oh, I'm a, I'm a horizontal material mover. I'm not allowed vertical moving. I'm not allowed <laughs> horizontal moving. I can only move. <laughs> so he stuck to his job description and wasn't allowed to move the boxes a different direction. Exactly. So he sits there for 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, my that's God. How of, that's how you go out of business. But I got, you know, 20 stories like that. I mean, that, that's like Soviet Union level type of stuff there where um, where, uh, I interviewed Yuri Maltsev and he said the Soviet Union for decades was where the government pr- pretends to pay you and the workers pretend to work. Exactly. Yeah. We, I mean, we had a uh, there was an electrician at a uh, big three plant. He uh, somehow got through, had someone take the exams for him. He became an electrician in the plant. Then they found out he's colorblind. He can't see the wires. Is it red, green, or yellow? So they couldn't have him working on any of that. So they pay him to go around changing light bulbs, you know, full electrician salary. So it's those kind of things that just like you can't basically can't be fired. I mean, it's almost impossible. You literally almost have to shoot somebody to get fired at a, at a UAW plant. So it makes perfect sense and why the big three, so General Motors, Ford, and what's Chrysler, the other one, or whoever bought Chrysler, Dodge, Chevy, Dodge, Chrysler, whoever bought them. I think it was a, a year ago. Yep. Hmm? Yep. Stetlantis, the company Stetlantis, they were formerly PSA. Now they own PSA, Jeep, uh, Chrysler, all the old, all those brands. Yeah. So it makes sense then that uh, they can only make a good profit with the sport utility vehicles, and then they're going to struggle with something more efficient and more delicate, more technical than than uh, the more advanced. I would say with technical stuff with the electric vehicles. Exactly, they need that sixty seventy thousand dollar price point. When they try to do twenty thousand, they lose money. So, 
Now, as you mentioned correctly, they're trying to work out EVs, which is kind of a nightmare for them. Um, it's like a whole new car. I mean, it's a completely different motor uh, te technology. And, the, you know, the amount, they're also not software companies in Detroit, right? So they struggle mightily with writing software and figuring out the move to the digital. Oh, yeah. The yeah. the stuff in the dashboard for Ford is ter for Ford has been terrible for decades, uh, or at least it was. I haven't seen it for in the last couple of years, but for decades it was just terrible. So far behind. Right. So you got a company like Tesla, and I think a BYD out of China, they run like software companies, update, 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 and just constant refreshment, and that's why they're lapping people. You know, they're they're just. Uh, I you know I think Detroit's kind of unfortunately the Walking Dead in this whole situation. Maybe you get one of the one of the big three survive. Yeah, they're they're kind of run like a Chinese state-owned enterprise because I've heard some of the stories about waste, fraud, corruption, abuse at the large Chinese state-owned enterprise. So like the aluminum manufacturers, the steel ones, how how wasteful a lot of those things were run keeping employees on the payroll. Sounds like that then that the U.S. is run is running like these too big to fail. Uh, large corporations, yeah, the the executives at the top are overpaid with stock options, but the rest of the company is bloated and wasteful and inefficient and basically can't make that much of a profit. Yeah, that's correct. Like you pointed out, they're, they are making huge money on their SUVs, but uh, that could, you know, th th that could disappear overnight. So these companies, when they like things like when they go on strike or things like this, or the volumes go down, or just the oil price, gasoline, all you need is like right. California gas. You think people in right. California want to pay seven dollars a gallon if you have a sport utility vehicle? <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, these companies are so capital intensive. You know, when you start, when you fall below a certain line, you just start hemorrhaging money like insane. So that's what happened in 2008 in the credit crisis. When credit stopped, car sales stopped, all of a sudden all these factories and labor, whoa, I mean, you are, you're going bankrupt in 60 days. So, um, well, well Dan, I, I think we could talk for another couple hours. I got one more question before I let you go. So yep. it sounds like the Chinese economy is going to be restructuring then with the real estate losses, credit, some of the problems there, but overall they're going to be fine five or 10 years from now. So it's not a China collapse scenario. Maybe it's kind of, they slug through for five or 10 years, similar j to Japan, but not a collapse. Would you expect then, even with their demographics problems, uh, having problems with the one child policy and others, would you expect then long-term growth in commodities demand for th for basic things? So food and energy, things like that, where people in China eat more calories, they, they are consuming more natural gas for um, electrical utilities and uh, gasoline and diesel and things like that. Okay. Good question. Interesting question. And something that people didn't realize, Sinopec, the Chinese oil firm this year, came out and said, this year is peak oil demand in China. And that's because 30% of the cars now sold, actually it was up to 50% last month, are EVs. Like China's perfect for EVs. Like we talked about that for here. We're going to coexist with EVs and ICE vehicles because we have longer ranges and we're more rural in certain areas. But China loves EVs and they've literally reached peak oil. They don't think it will ever grow from here. It will only go down. And within 10 years, you're looking at half of the oil use that they use today. Okay, that's number one on the oil side. Number two, and they're the world's largest oil importer, as everybody knows. And then number, and what's that going to do for the Saudis? You know, that's fantastic ramifications. As well, the the Saudis also have natural gas deals. So Qatar has an, uh, just signed a thirty year natural gas deal with China. The Saudis okay. also have a fertilizer plant and pipelines with natural gas. So the Saudis are kind of diversified with fertilizer right. and petrochemicals and natural gas. It's not just oil with the Saudis. Sure. Yeah. And, and the net gas will run the plant. So China, that, that will always be there for China. Uh, China is actually an ag superpower. People don't realize it. China is the world's largest grain producer. OK, they produce 25 percent of the world's grain. So a lot of people are like, oh, they're, you know, they have to import food. Yes, they import some food, but a lot of time it's just to keep prices down. You know, so um, they're going to get getting more and more food from Russia all the time, more and more oil from Russia. This, as I mentioned, the China Russia axis is coming together. Um, they installed more robots in China last year than the United States has in enti its entirety. So the automation in China is incredible. It's it's 5G linked. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution. They talk. They don't even know what that means here. Are these like factory robots? Are these like assembly robots? robots? Are are they doing like the electric vehicles? So what are the robots doing? They're assembly robots. Um, you know, pick and move. Um, transport. 
Um, these e-commerce facilities, they're incredible. Some of these, e- you know, e-commerce facilities, you see Taobao. So is this like kind of an Amazon warehouse where kind of you yep. see, uh, you can watch a 60 minutes like feature on this where there's robots on the track. So China has that like in a giant Amazon warehouse. It's not, not a yep. human being running and getting your Amazon goods. It's Correct. a robot on tracks. Absolutely. And that's the key to prosperity in the future, right? If you can have factories with nobody there, they're just creating prosperity and value. They're doing stuff people don't need to do. People can do other things and make and make and add value to the economy. So they are like uh, their factories are way ahead of ours. Our factories are ridiculous. Our defense suppliers are ridiculous. They're, you know, like 30 years behind. So um, so in terms of the demand, like the demographics is a real absolute issue. I, I, you know, lived there 20 years. I can count on one hand the people I know with two kids, okay? And I know a lot of people with no kids. And most people are one kid. So so um, it's, a, it's a trap. You have four grandparents, two parents, and one grandchild. It's completely inverted pyramid. I mentioned earlier in the show, they're probably really a 0.7 birth rate, but they're, gonna, they're doing all these new policies now to try to get that up. One of them is going to be to crash housing just to make urban living easier for people. But um, yeah, do you, think then, do you think then all the coal pollution and all the chemicals and stuff dumped in by the manufacturing, like the coal pollution in the air, water and soil, is that also causing a drop in the fertility rate, too? So that's a, I mean, yeah, one could speculate just the overall environmental pollution that's happened over the decade. It's gotten a lot better. They put in a lot of safety uh, or a lot of, in, you know, environmental pollution control uh, directors got put in every like industrial district started hammering people. This 10 years ago, the skies look totally different. When I was an exchange student in Beijing, literally like after the winter ended, the skies cleared a bit and there was a mountain there. I had not even known was there. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how coal smoke filled the skies were. So um, it's improved a lot, but yeah, the health of people, you know, cannot be great. Um, there's been a lot of pollution. And anytime you make stuff, you're, you're dirtying up the environment, you know? So um, it could be, it could be who's who I, you know, I don't know. It's possible, but, um, it, uh, birth rates are declining everywhere. It's kind of a big global impending disaster. How the whole world manages this. It's not just China, it's South Korea. They're down to 0.7. I mean, it's just insanity. Uh, what's going on there. So I see how the trends will develop. China's going to have to move their factories out. They've got no choice. So the other demographic issue we didn't talk before we go, is the education. So when I moved to China, 5% of people got a university degree. Today, that number is 50% and climbing fast. That's going to go near 100% level, okay? Similar to South Korea. China's super education focused. What happens at that point? Nobody, and today you see that, nobody with a university degree wants to go on a iron cast foundry line or an assembly line. They want to go work at a Chinese tech company and get stock options or work at a bank that, or work at a bank exactly. in Hong Kong or, or the mainland right. Shanghai and do stock trading or currency trading. Exactly. They'll take a job in Starbucks before they want to go work on a factory line. That's a peasant job to them. So so you've got that whole this internal di- di- dynamic that you've never seen a world population this big growing up the education ladder so fast. Right. So and and so that's why all the robots are coming. They don't have workers. It's a it's a big issue now. So when I first plant I ran in China, we paid workers one hundred twenty dollars a month. That same plant today, I know, pays people fifteen hundred dollars a month. (laughs) How many years? uh, How many years uh, change was that, though? That was probably 10 years, 12 years. I mean, not a lot for a 10x. Right. But that's China's always had inflation. And, uh, you know, that it always had double digit inflation generally over the last 20 years. Um, but yeah, the, the labor, China's not cheap labor anymore. That's gone. They're, they're thousand a month, 1500 a month. No problem. They're four X, the labor rates in Mexico, five X India, China, India, they're probably six X the labor rates, but they're keeping the manufacturing because the companies are so efficient, right? Prototyping, get it done, get it shipped. The ports are all networked and connected. That's part of building a productive technological juggernaut economy which we need to actually take lessons from and start building out here you know well dan i think we're gonna have to have you back on for china updates and then also talked about talk about manufacturing in different countries and improvements there's so many interesting things too going on with manufacturing with robotics the computer systems improving and then 3d printing there's a lot of exciting things going forward for manufacturing too absolutely looking forward to it Okay, well, if my listeners want to follow you on Twitter, take a look at your work, your companies, how do they do so? 
Oh, uh, I'm at Twitter, Dan Collins 2011. Just find me there. Yep. And he's one of the most undervalued China experts. I mean, when I had questions about China, I'd be going to Dan over the years. So he managed money in China. He's run factories in China. Just a really impressive resume. One of the most impressive resume, whereas like a lot of these quote unquote China experts, I mean, they have a thousand times as many Twitter followers as Dan. I think they're getting paid seven figures a year to do speaking and consulting engagements and write a book. And um, they don't know half as much as Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> You are exactly correct, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's mo like most of DC here. It's all marketing and putting the lipstick on the pig. Yep, yep. I've also got a, a podcast I do. I haven't done one in a couple months, though. Chaos Incorporated. You can find me on YouTube on that.